Hi, I'm Karl, pastor of Shafa Swakobund. We're a family church and we've got a passion to make a difference in our community through making disciples, reaching the nations and generations. I trust that this message will be a blessing to you. We're busy at this stage um, with a four-week sermon, um, four weeks, uh, what do you call it now? Series is the word, thank you. Um, on stewardship and finances and giving and Philip Gerber from Windhoek was the Philip he started last week off with the generous God and I'm going to focus a little bit today on the Old Testament side of seeing something about God's heart and I must say it was a challenge because Yaku, uh, Pastor Yaku van Rooyen is next week he's going to minister on the New Testament so uh, to stay on this side of the fence of the Old Testament and not to, to jump to the New uh, it was a good challenge one I really enjoyed so uh, if you missed something you can catch up uh, last week's sermon or in future I believe it will be something of uh, building a foundation now you know just at this stage my my children my boys are eight years old my little daughter she's six or I said little but they not that little they grow up so fast now I understand why my dad always said when we uh, were young he's going to put a brick on our heads possibly to stop us grow and now that I'm a father myself I think I want to also put a few bricks on them and just keep them where they are right now but, you know, they ask a lot of questions, you know, children, they want to know, they want to understand how does this engine work, or if you come in here in Swakop Munt, um, over the bridge is this massive screen, TV type of screen, and they want to know, so is it now electricity, or does this thing have solar power, or batteries, or how does it work, and why is it so bright, and, you know, we as parents, we can always give them just a, you know, a short, stupid answer, but they want to know the truth, and the truth is so important. You know, for us, one of, in Bible school, first year and second year, we, we look at apologetics. And I guess the heart of apologetics for us is to be able to defend the biblical truth. To be, when we talk to people, when we share, to answer people and to say what the biblical truth is. Now, for us to say this is the truth, we have to distinguish between truth and lies. What is from God and what is not from God. And many times, as, as Daniel said uh, right now, um, you know we grow up in certain walks of life and cultures and places and faiths or lacks of it. And then, you know, we have our wiring. And sometimes God really has to come and to take a brick that is from the world and replace it with a biblical one, something that is the truth. And I believe especially when we talk about finances and stewardship, and giving, and God's heart, and those type of things. You know, there's a few, a few worldly type of thinking we have, and things that God really wants to, to change in our lives. But we know Scripture says in the book of John that the truth will set us free. And the Word is the truth. And what I want to share this morning is hopefully, of I believe, is only based on truth. And, uh, you know, just in the past week at Bible school, third year, you know, we once again, we were actually talking about preaching and preparing in the different types of sermons. And we saw there, it was so beautiful, it says, because God is relational and covenantal, covenantal, you know, God wants His will to be known. God wants to be known, and He wants us to know what His will is. And that we're going to hear in Scripture. We're going to see it in the Word of God. And if we just very, very fast um, reflect on in a sense, where everything, you know, there was a time with the Hebrew people that they didn't know God. When all the nations didn't know God. And God took these people for himself. He was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see the creation events, Noah, and the flood, and all, all those things happening. And then God was walking with his people, showing them who he is. That is holy. That is a father. That is a God who can perform miracles with a cause, with a reason, you know, and, and how all those things um, came together. He took his people out of Egypt. He walked with them. And then, then Exodus um, 20 or 22, 22, you know, he gave them the Ten Commandments and, and started to teach them and taught them who he is and how things actually work, showing them really as a father. And as for us regarding, you know, finances also, you know, there's so many if I have got 30 or 40 minutes right now, I believe we're just going to um, reach or touch the tip of, a, of the iceberg. Uh, iceberg, yeah. <laughs> Sounds so funny. Ice. And uh, I really want to encourage you that from an Old Testament perspective, that in the week or in your quiet time, that you will go and do some further study. 
go and research. Um, maybe you've got a study Bible or even on Google or something. Um, you can go and research a little bit and see. Sometimes you, in some articles you need to eat the meat and spit out the bones, literally. Um, but go and read a little bit for yourself. I've got three main scriptures that I want to share this morning and that I want to say this is the word this morning that we should go home with. And hopefully God will change all of our views because none of us can say we know everything about God. God is infinite in his wisdom in everything. So I want to start this morning. I want to read to us from Psalm 50. And guess what? I'm going to read, read verse 1 to verse 15. Okay? So if you are very tired this morning, you can stand while I'm reading that you don't fall asleep. If you are distracted or something, pin yourself. But I'm going to actually read 15 verses I'm not sure if the church is any more these days used to it, but I'm going to read it this morning. So everyone is awake because everyone is sitting down. I believe you're okay. There we go. Listen to the words. I'm going to share a little bit from this. The mighty one. Okay. I don't have all the verses there. I've got just a core that I want to look at. It. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting out of Zion. The perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth beneath, that he may judge his people. Greater to uh, uh, Gather to me my faithful ones, who, ma who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is the judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or a goat from your folds. For every beast of the uh, forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I, I, I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the fields is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its, its fullness is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Now, I remember once in a preaching in Vinduk and I was actually thinking it was about exegesis or something. And I asked everyone in church, if you were to go on your own to an island and you can only take two books from scripture, which would you take? And you know, there was the guys who said, no, it's something from the New Testament or maybe Genesis. And uh, I asked a few people in church, so what, what books do you actually value most? Because we know all of scripture are important. But Psalms were actually one of the books quite a few people mentioned. Maybe it's because there are so many of them. Maybe it's because there's so, a lot of wisdom in it. But Psalms are beautiful. And here we've got a cold cut. God says here he's not going to keep silent. Silent, okay? I think people, for some reason, we, we love court cases. Uh, we know the Oscar Pretorius and Pistorius. These court cases, sometimes it's always on the, uh, many times on the head of a, headlines of a newspaper. And we want to know, did he do that? this or did he do that? Is he guilty or halfway guilty or anything? But here we see God says, I'm the judge. I'm everything. I'm the guy with the hammer. I'm the, the person accusing. And here we can know and see we've got a perfect God. His judgment will be perfect. There's no way that God's going to miss something. There's something that God's not going to that God's not going to see or something, okay? God comes here and he says, I'm calling the heavens and the earth, the things that have been there before you. God isn't speaking here to the unbelievers there. He's talking to his own people, the own people who's, who, with whom he's got a covenant. And he says, you come before me. Now, there's so much and as in, a, in, in scripture for us. It's always so rich. But the angle I want to focus on this morning, and I, I'm going to... Uh, break it up hopefully as I as I continue is something about God and about us that we need to understand when we talk about finances and giving and owning and who belongs to who and what there will be more clarification but God here comes and he says here here oh my people I will speak 
and I will, I will testify against you. And then he says, actually, your offerings are continuously before me. It's not like you're going to surprise me or something. I exactly know when you give or for that matter not give. God knows exactly what is in our hearts. Now, we think maybe God has got the issue with what, he's give, what the people were giving. Or, but he says there, listen, I can see you are giving. And, but then he continues here, and from verse 8 onwards, especially to verse 12 or 13, God is fighting actually with his people because they have got a wrong perception of who God is. And that's the important thing. They've got a wrong view, and now they entered into a wrong religious type of giving. And obviously you can read a little bit around that, the Old Testament in the background. I'm not, I'm not going to go into that specifically this morning. But God is fighting with them. And he says, listen, don't you understand who I am? Do you think I get hungry? Do you think I need something that you are giving me? I own the, the beasts on the field. I own the cattle on the thousand hills. Everything is mine. I am not wired like man. I don't think like you in that sense. I don't look like you or function like you. I don't need the flesh of animals to fool myself. I am God. I am the king of kings. I'm God almighty. Okay? There's something there that we really have to, to understand, you know. When we bring something to God, we need to know who God is. And the, sec the next verses I'm going to use will show you something about that. Now, you will all know from experience I'll speak to the husbands or the men here this morning, where you can really dig a hole for yourself if you do something like the following. You get at home, say, after work, and you tell your wife, Yo, I drove past that shop and there was beautiful um, flowers. I actually wanted to stop and buy them for you, you know, but there were two cars behind me and I couldn't find a parking. So I just want to tell you you're beautiful and just, just feel that, you know, I actually wanted to buy those things, but, uh, you know, there were cars behind me and stuff. What's going to happen? <laughs> you know, you're in trouble. Your wife is going to say, but couldn't you make a plan? Drove around the block, make a little bit effort, and just stop. And you said you wanted to buy me flowers, but you didn't. Okay? So, and usually there, marriage preparation, marriage counseling, marriage saving, all those type of things actually come in. Because, you know, if you say to someone, I actually wanted to... Flowers or chocolate is probably a flower. Chocolates will also work in that, in that thing, I guess. You know, the right thing for the husband would be to say, listen, I'll walk 500 meters. In the rain and the snow, I fight 10 beats, overcome 10 robbers. Here, my love, here's the chocolates. And uh, just let me stop the bleeding here. And, uh, you know, I've done it. <sighs> Last breath, and then you kind of fell there. I promise you, you're going to be a hero for the next 10 years. But don't. Go and do the other one. I wanted to buy flowers, but, you know, I was too busy. I don't have money. I don't have time or something. You can really miss it there. Now, God is busy with his people here and telling them, listen, I can see your offering, but your mindset is wrong. The way you have slipped into a place of religiousness, thinking that you're going to walk in here and you're actually going to give something to God and you're going to help God to feel better. God says the whole world, whole creation, everything that lives on it in that sense belongs to God. Full stop. Okay? Nothing that we give God can make God feel better about himself. God doesn't think like that. God doesn't work like that in any sense. So we need to understand firstly that whenever we bring something to God, who God is, he's a holy God. He's an awesome God. He's a perfect God in every way. And nothing that we can bring can we can bribe God in a sense. We can, you know, sometimes I get a, a shivering just talking about court cases where I see people so full of themselves. And I think they actually think that one day when they stand before God, they're going to have all the answers and they, on a technical note, they're going to get catch God regarding, say, eternal life or heaven or hell or something like that. But people, we, na we need to understand who God is. This sermon isn't really that much about, don't tell Yaku, but it's, it's actually more about God than about finances. Because one of the main things I want to tell you this morning, and I know from my own experience, all of us probably, somewhere in our life, whether Christian or not, have felt we're not going to have enough. We are afraid of the future. 
we are afraid of everything that costs so much, etc. The best and the only advice I can give you is when God becomes bigger in our lives, our problems can get smaller. Sometimes we try to work harder and we try to make the problem smaller, but God isn't getting bigger. Then we're backpedaling. We're not making really progress. Because God owns anything, everything. Everything God has, everything belongs to Him. And so many times, church, we can have a wrong view of God and in a wrong way of, of, think, uh, uh, of giving. You can walk in here Maybe you had a bad week, you fell a lot into sin, you really messed up, if I can put it that way. And you think, if I give more money, okay, God will love me more, or forgive my sins, or maybe I can, I can feel a little bit better about myself. Maybe you really believe in the church and the leaders or, and what we do, and you think, you know, I'm just going to give a tip, and you know, it will help a lot. Or something. I'm not condemning this morning, but we should just understand firstly that God is huge. God is massive. God is everything and nothing that we do. God is the owner of everything. Okay? And God is actually fighting here with his people and it ends off beautifully in verse 14. It says, Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in a day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify my name. Because that's ultimately always what God wants. And I want to read to us from, from Malachi. Now, just talking about the uh, scripture and the love for the word. Who of you guys actually read the book of Malachi, say, in the last six months? Hey, there was at least hey, there's two people, but you and Afrikaans service as well. The book of Malachi is where it's the last book in the Old Testament. Okay? Go and read it. Sometimes we, we skip the, mi the minor prophets, the smaller ones. And there's so much wisdom, there's so much richness that God actually wants to show us about himself. I started and I said, we should know the truth. The truth will set us free. And God wants to be known. And every, in every book of scripture, there's something that God wants us to see. There's no book in scripture that we can say, ah, this isn't really important. I'll skip it. Go and read it. I want to read to us this morning Malachi chapter 1 from verse 6 to 9. And then verse 13 as well. God is, in a sense, fighting here again with his people, especially the priests. And he says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord, Lord of hosts to you. O priests who despise my name, but you say, How... Um, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar? But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. Verse 8. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present, uh, present that to your governor. Um, will he accept you or show favor? says the Lord of hosts, and now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious um, to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. I just want to take a sip of water. Talking for 40 minutes nonstop just makes you thirsty. What God is talking here about, and he says, listen, I am God Almighty. And this is something that is very clear in the Old Testament. God in the Ten Commandments everywhere just saying that he's a holy God, he's a consuming fire. And he comes here and he says, when you bring offerings to me, do you bring the worst that you have, the blind and the sick and the lame and those things that were actually stolen or you've begotten it through violence? Do you bring those things to me and you actually want favor? You actually think that I am God, I'm going to be pleased. I am a holy God. I am a perfect God. You want to bring those things and in a sense fool me and now you want to walk away and you want to feel blessed? Where the scripture actually goes on and says, take that to your governor. Take that to probably your um, mayor or your president and see if he will be impressed. Okay? People don't, men, don't take, don't tell your wife 
oh, I really wanted to buy your flowers, but you didn't do it. Don't come to God in this sense and say, God, I love you, you're the best. Um, and you take the worst that you have and you give it to God. We all know life is busy, life is fast. And we really value it. I value it. If someone gives from their time, someone stands still and they give something of value. I'm just going to use it as an example. If you own $100, let's use the example, and you give 90 of that away, you're really giving a lot away. If you earn, or if you own a million dollars and you give 200 away, you're also giving, but you're not giving that much. Now, God is not here into quantity. God is, God is here into quality. He says, I'm God Almighty. Go and read the book of Revelation, the whole of it, and just see where Jesus with the flames in his eyes and the sword and the word, and he's going to conquer and he's going to judge the nations. And God is telling the people, God is teaching the people here, okay? And God didn't change, by the way. God didn't change when the year 2000 came. God is exactly the same. And God says here, don't bring the worst that you have to me. Bring what is perfect. Bring what is blessed. Bring what is holy. Why do you think God once talks about the first fruits? Not the last few rotten drops of maize or corn or something. You want to bring that to God, but he will receive it probably. But this scripture says, the blame of the lame and the sick, those things. Go and take it to a human and see if they will be impressed. I'm God, I'm God Almighty, and I'm not impressed, okay? God wants something that actually costs us something. Why? Because this whole thing, this whole argument isn't really about money. Whether you give, it was a terrible, we need to pray for that person actually, but I remember a year ago, I just got to Swakop, there was this one video clip that went around and, it was this lady, I think, in South Africa, and, and she talks about giving the money to the church. And, uh, you know, the lady said, you know, you can bring South African rands or U.S. dollars, but no Zim dollars. Okay? God doesn't want your Zim dollars. Okay? And it was a terrible sick joke, in a sense, because it's exposing people. It, the bait means it, it was really, it, the whole spirit behind it was really bad. And then we all know the Zimbabwe dollars didn't at that stage or now even have a lot of value. But you see, it's not about Namibian dollars or U.S. dollars or pounds or euros and bringing that to God. I'm just going to use one scripture from the New Testament, and that's that, that widow with the two copper coins. And she gave, and God, Jesus said, you're actually giving so much more. Because she, a widow usually doesn't, in that context, own a salary, have something, a farm or a, something bringing income. She gave a lot. But it's from where you stand. And people, as we stand here this morning, or as you sit here this morning, I want to challenge us. Because, because God is challenging us. Our time, our effort, when we stand here and there's an opportunity to worship God. Do I stand here and I'm thinking about my car and maybe later today and, yeah, this is part of the song I really relate to. And, yeah, I mean, bless you God, you're a good God. And then I think about you know, the plants that need water again, and, and that type of attitude. Or just, or does God really want true worshipers who worship Him in spirit and in truth, who says, God, I'm going to worship you, I'm going to close my eyes, I'm going to jump, I'm going to uh, uh, lift my hands, or whatever you feel moved to do. I'm going to read scripture, and God, I'm going to worship you, because you are the Alpha and the Omega. Romans chapter 1, God created everything we can see in its usefulness, in its proper design, that there's a creator. God, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to thank you. Okay? So it's not just about finances and, and money in that sense. God is so clear here that when we bring to him, that he wants the best. And that starts actually in our heart. It's not about, God, this amount or that amount. Okay? It's about what we give to God and the heart that we give it with. Someone can tithe and it can be a million dollars. God's not going to impress if that million is actually 1%. If I can just use it as an example to, to drive that thing home very clearly. God wants the best. Let's go to Leviticus. Now we're going to move back in time, but to the front of your Bible. You with me? Amen. Back in time to the front of the Bible. Leviticus 22, verse 21 to 22. And one anyone offers a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering from the herd or from the flock. 
to be accepted. It must be perfect. There shall be no blemish in it. Animals blind or disabled or mutilated or having a discharge or on it, um, on it and itch or scraps, you shall not offer to the Lord or give them to the Lord as a food offering on the altar. Why? Why does God say it? It's scripture. God's not going to eat it. God isn't, I'm saying it with respect, into prime Namibian beef and he just wants a, 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 a cattle from this area or that. Okay? God's not going to eat it or something, but it's going to cost us something. If you give that thing that's going to die in any way, that's walking there on three legs, that's anyway going to die in two days' time, and you give it to God and say, God, I'm giving it to you as an offering, I'm sowing it to you, you're a holy God. No, 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 that's not in line. People, what I want you to see this morning, and there's so much more scriptures reg regarding this, it's, it's not about or, or what God is making really clear here this morning, that he wants the best. He wants that first fruit. When we serve God, when we, when we give our time or whatever it might be in life, it's if you, in that sense, tip God. I mean, let's use the example in life. If many times, you know, there's expectation in some restaurants, calculate the, the tip already in. If you ate for 2,000 and you had a big family meal and 2,000 Namibian dollars, maybe I'll pray for you afterwards because it's a lot of money. But, you know, and here the poor waiter has been serving you and listening to all your requests the children's tomato sauce and the salt and the medium to rare and everything must be perfect. And there at the end of the night, you say, oh, thank you. You really served us so well. Uh, we had this meal for $2,000. I'll be awesome. I'll give you $5 just to say thank you. Will you feel that that person actually mean what they do? Okay. God is using this and he's telling us. And I'm just saying, Yaku is going to talk next week on, on the New Testament focus. But God stays the same. God didn't change. And God just says it so clearly here. Uh, bring the best. Bring the first fruits. Now, I'm not saying um, sell your house today and make a silly mistake and that you can, you know, we can never, we, we can actually never give something to God that's going to make God richer or feel better about Him. He doesn't need that. Okay? When, when we do things like that in a worldly term, okay, you will see, well, Someone has really blessed me or something like that. But it's something we need to take home here this morning from God. If we look at even at the Ten Commandments and just look at the first three. You shall only serve me, and I'm just using my own words here. There shall be no other God, it's only me, no carved image. Don't use my name in vain. I will come back to get you in a sense. Okay? Why does God say that? Why does God show that about himself? It's that we can, that we can see of something about who God is as a king and a priest and a judge and just an awesome God. He's the king about of all kings. So people, when, when I actually, later just now, I, I really want to pray this morning and I actually want to say that's the most important, important part of the sermon. You know, I've got this picture in my heart today especially that I don't want to pray with anyone who says, Man, I'm, I'm in financial trouble. I can't solve that. But I want to challenge you, and I want to say, when we start to change our view on who God is, maybe your view is awesome, and then you can just go to, go to a place of more, being more glorious. But maybe, you know, sometimes I was like that a lot of times earlier in my life, you know, and I want to hold back, and I hope I can have more. Whether it's finances or many other things, I wanted to put a fence around it, and when I say, mine, 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 you know, like when children are small, that's, you know, my children, mine, just mine, they want to put the stamp on it and says, it's mine. You know, God wants us to learn to be givers, and especially when we give to God, that it will be from a view of who God is, of bringing the first fruits, the best that we have, and not hopefully, God, if there's something left at the end of the month, I'll give something to you. I'll challenge you. It will take a lot of discipline. But you see, the bigger God gets in our lives, the smaller our problems will become. The, and obviously the other way around. If God isn't really there, then usually our challenges seem huge. And I really want to hold that before us. I want to end off with a testimony. 
my testimonies are powerful. Daniel, thanks for phoning me early this morning and asking if you could share. Church, you are welcome to share testimonies. But middle January, early in the year before the school started, me and my wife, our three children, I made them sit down on a beautiful afternoon. I said to them, we're going to pray for the year. Okay? I understand my role as the king, the priest, the judge, judge and the prophet of this house, but I want you to learn to grow in something. I personally, I do give my children pocket money, small amount, age appropriate, because there's a bit of stewardship involved, and I want them to grow. But I want you guys to pray. We're going to pray now, and we're going to have communion. And you must tell, we're going to talk about our faith goals for the year. Okay? My ch- boys are eight, girl is six, little Ulrike. So their faith goals were very fleshly. I want a motorbike, and I want a gun, and I want a doll, and a, you know, typical things. No problem. But I wanted to stretch them, okay, that they will be, that they can learn to trust for something that I can't give to them, or that I won't give to them, because it will not be in their benefit, okay? That they can learn to go to God and trust God, and say, God, I trust not in my father in Carl, I trust in you that you can give something to me. Now, my wife is pro- obviously a better believer than I am, and she had a faith goal as well. And we prayed, we had communion, we prayed over that, and we said, God, we trust you. And, you know, when we have faith goals, you know, it doesn't, from where I stand, it doesn't help to, to trust for, and that's just personal, for $5. I can work for $5. I can, I can get my hands on that. But my wife said, God, I'm going to, my faith goal, and I, pre- I asked him before the time to actually pray about it and just think about it. And my wife went and she said, God, I'm going to trust you, and I'm not going to give the specific detail. You can speak to her because I feel it's in a sense her testimony. But she went and she said, God, I'm going to trust you for something in December that we will be able to do something specific. Not, in, not possible to say for that, not m- possible, I don't steal, so I can't steal the money. And uh, if you find me stealing, hold me accountable, please. Um, but you see, she said, God, I'm going to trust you, not for being president of the uh, Namibian nation or something, because it's possible, but for us as a family to say for that, not possible. It's now the end of July, and you know, in the past week, God actually, I want to say, engineered circumstances, and someone, specifically to my wife, blessed her with the amount of money that we needed for that faith goal to become true. And you know what? Listen to her, but actually God gave over and above. He actually gave us more. And the, the way it worked is actually, in a sense, hilarious. I actually want to laugh because it's, it, it's just too good to be true in a sense. But now you can say something, yeah, well, probably you were lucky, Carl, or something like that. No, no, no. I'll take you back to 15 January. And I said, specifically, this is what we prayed for as a family, what we trusted for. Okay? And God, today we can say, from in private or a pulpit, God, I believe you gave over and abundantly what we trusted you for. Now, yes, just a small clause. Sometimes we come to God and we say, like my eight-year-old son that wants a quad bike. If I give him a quad bike, he's going to kill himself. So I'm going to be a good father and for the next 20 years not give him something like that. Okay? If, you, if your eight-year-old son has a quad bike, you, you really have to, a big one now talking we have to talk about it, JP, afterwards. But bottom line is just sometimes we say, God, I'm trusting you for my million dollars at the end of the year. And then God actually comes, or my new car, or whatever, he can fill it in the gap. But then you don't get it. Now, how do I deal with that? God knows better. Sometimes we trust God for stuff, and he actually gives it in two years' time. God, I trust you for my, my throw fro, the person I want to marry by... 10th of August. Now you only get it next year, November. Maybe that's a word for someone. Okay. Now, the thing is just, uh, I'm sorry. The thing is just, on a serious note, is that God knows better. He knows, sometimes, He gives something to us a season later. Sometimes, you don't get your child. You don't get your trauman or trofro or your quad bike right now when you want it. Okay. God comes and He gives it later on fight with God 
I'm just telling, giving you the message in that sense. But that's the way I have personally come to know God. Sometimes God do come and we have our faith goal early in the year and I say, God, we trust you as a family. We have communion on this thing. We pray about it and now we give it over. We give it to you. We can't even save for this. It's not within our reach. And God comes and he makes it through in an even more spectacular way. Why? It said it in verse 13 and 14. That in our day of need, we can call unto God and that he can be glorified. Okay? Church, we shouldn't bring the lame and the sick and the blind and the everything to God. If I can use that example, most of us, none of us are any more farmers. There were baskets at the back where we take up the offering. We don't bring sheep and stuff. Okay? But it's about the heart. We can still give to the church or to God with the attitude of, God, I'll see what I have and I put it in there and hopefully you are pleased and hopefully I feel better about myself. God here in Leviticus, God in Malachi, God in Psalms, it's the same God that we serve. And God says, fear me, respect me. I'm a holy God. Bring a holy offering to me. And I just believe it's something we live on the other side of grace right now. Probably Yaku will refer to that where we can give over and ab abundantly and those type of things. But let's uh, just make very sure regarding this area of finances and stewardship and giving and bringing to God that we can see who God is, who the Father of heaven and earth is, okay? And that when we trust God and we say, God, I'm going to have a faith call, I'm going to pray and intercede for A, B, or C, that we see this problem might become very small because we serve a big God. If our God isn't big enough, I want to challenge you this morning, go back home, go back to small group, to Bible school, to church, wherever, drink a coffee with someone, where you can see this person has got the living relationship and a testimony with God about making things come true or fall into place, which wasn't possible. We call it believers. We call it faith. We call it Christian. Amen. Let us pray together. Father God, we, we want to stand here this morning, Lord, and on this day, Lord, and Father, you say that our offerings, or even the lack of it, are continuously before you, Lord God. Father, I take your word for the 100% truth, Lord. Father, you know our hearts, you know our fears, you know our complaints, you know everything about us, Father. You know the church sitting here, what their hearts are, Lord God, maybe their fears, maybe what we think, Lord Maybe we think it was just luck this this happened to this family that I was sharing about. But Lord, we don't function on luck in the church. We pray. We are biblical Christians with, with faith, Lord God. And Father, we, we share testimonies because we see your hand in our lives. Father, I thank you for the testimony even that I heard this morning in, about Korichas and those children who didn't need the medication. But we prayed for them, Lord God. And Father, you can shame us even in that sense so many ways. Where we thought, Lord, we're going to pray this prayer in faith, but I don't think it will happen. And then, God, you come and it, you actually give us more. Father, we want to repent of having too little faith. Father, Father, strengthen our faith. Strengthen our hearts, Lord. Father, I pray you will build us up this morning, Lord God. And Lord, for every person sitting here, Right now, going in their minds through a list of things where we, they're going to trust you, Lord, and trust you for salvation, trust you for salvation or deliverance regarding finances. Lord, it's going to start with a view and a picture and a biblical truth and belief of who you are, that you are God Almighty, that you are the perfect judge. And when you call your people to judgment, we should just be very quiet and listen to what you say. Because you're a holy God. And that will never ever change, Lord. And Father, I pray that, that our hearts will start to absorb this thing, Lord. Where you say that when your covenant people bring to you, Lord. That they will bring the perfect sheep. The perfect cow or ox. But not the lame and the sick. Lord, you say in your word, we should even take that to the governor. And see if he will be impressed. He will not be, Lord. Father, give us pure hearts. Father, give us clean hands that, Lord God, that our offering from our hearts, Lord, that we can bring in and we say, you're a holy God. 
that we can kind of respect you, Lord God. And Father, thank you, Lord, that there's a principle at work here, that when we leave, Lord God, that we can actually smile and walk away, that you actually wired our human hearts to feel good when we give, Lord God. That's why you say that we should be cheerful givers, people who love to give. Lord, that we will not try to put chains or fences or hedges around what is ours and just protect it so much. Lord, that we will be able to be good stewards, but to give as well, to give to a holy God what belongs to him in Jesus. Thanks for listening to this message. If you've got any questions or if you would like to get to know us better, please contact us. The details will appear below. I want to also encourage you to listen to some of our other video material. The details will be on the screen. If you're in the surroundings and you want to come and visit us, you're most welcome. We would love to get to know you better.